At Fermilab, we study nature at its most fundamental, drilling down to the smallest scales of matter using some of the largest and most advanced machines in the world. Accelerators, powerful microscopes, send particles barreling at near light speed into other matter, creating subatomic scraps. Detectors zoom in on those fleeting pieces, making the invisible perceptible. And sophisticated computers sweep through all of it, crushing mountains of information into gems of data. We also use our cutting edge technology to explore the mysteries of dark matter and the quantum realm. Thousands of scientists from around the world partner with Fermilab to explore how the universe works, expanding humanity's understanding of matter, energy, space, and time. Fermilab is solving the mysteries of the universe. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Fermilab's 2022 Open House and our virtual driving tour of the Fermilab campus. My name is Rick Polad, and I'm an education facilitator here at the lab. Our tour guide today will be Laura Paterno. Laura is a computer scientist who worked on the D0 experiment and is now part of our EPE office working as an education facilitator. Also joining us are Mike Albro, Valerie Higgins, and Maureen Huey. Mike Elbro came to Fermilab 30 years ago from Stockholm University, where he was a professor. His PhD is from Manchester University in England, and he spent 18 years in Geneva at the CERN laboratory doing experiments with proton colliders. He was part of the teams that discovered the top quark at Fermilab and the Higgs boson at CERN, and is now scientist emeritus and still enjoys research after 58 years. Valerie Higgins is the Fermilab archivist and historian, and Maureen Huey is a Fermilab Natural Areas volunteer. We will begin with Laura guiding us on a driving tour around the Fermilab campus. During the tour, put your questions in chat, and either Laura or one of our experts will answer them after the tour is finished. Laura, it's all yours. Good afternoon, everyone. As Rick said, my name is Laura. And I'm going to be your tour guide today as we take a drive around the lab complex. Due to the amount of time it takes to get to parts of the lab, the video has been shortened to account for that. Be sure your seatbelts are fastened and let's begin our tour. So let's begin with an overview of Fermilab. Here is a map of our 6,800 acre or 10 square mile site. These are the sites we will be visiting today. Our main entrance is on the left or west side of the map. Here's an aerial photo with the main entrance marked on the left. This is where we will start our tour. Our tour begins driving under broken symmetry, a sculpture designed by our first director, Dr. Robert Rathbun Wilson, who had a vision for the lab that still shapes what we do here today. The sculpture is made from the steel remnants of a decommissioned Navy aircraft carrier called the USS Princeton. The sculpture weighs 42,000 pounds, about 19,000 kilograms, and rises 50 feet or 15, point a quart, 15 and a quarter meters above the road at its apex. And ordinarily, we would have stopped at that guard booth to show our credentials to enter the lab, but for this video, we had special permission to drive right through. Ahead on our right are some of the buildings in our neutrino research area, which we'll be visiting later. Fermilab was founded in 1967. Our site contains most of the major Midwest ecosystems, and in 1989 was designated as a National Environmental Research Park one of only six across the country. About one sixth of the site is restored tall grass prairie. We are driving through a portion of that prairie right now. The next building we'll be seeing on our right is the Letterman Science Center or LSC, which is named for Leon Letterman our second director, who was a big proponent of education and engagement with the public. The LSC houses many of our physical and life science programs available at the lab. It has hands-on exhibits, a science lab, a maker space, and a gift shop. In addition, we host classes, field trips, and tours for both students and the public.
You may have noticed that the road has been curving since we entered and continues to curve through this wooded area. Dr. Wilson's vision for the lab was not only scientific excellence, but also stewardship of the land, aesthetic beauty, fiscal responsibility, and equal opportunity. Because of his fashion for the environment, he directed that as much as possible of the original wooded areas on site be preserved. Several of the older trees at this location were spared by curving the road. And the ponds we are approaching to our right are used to dissipate the heat generated by the powerful electromagnets used to steer and focus the particle beams in our accelerator complex. They also attract a variety of waterfowl that live in or migrate to this area. And when the Tevatron was running, the pond was almost full every day with birds resting in warm, frequently steaming water. And behind the pond is the central hub of our site. That's Wilson Hall. If you've been here before, you may notice some changes in the area surrounding Wilson Hall. And we'll stop and take a look at that. And as we turn towards Wilson Hall, you can see Aqua Alefune, a sculpture that was built by Dr. Wilson as his parting gift to the laboratory. Wilson Hall, our central building on site, is 16 stories high and contains offices, laboratories, remote experiment control centers, an art gallery, meeting spaces, and a cafeteria. It is also attached to the Ramsey Auditorium, which seats over 800 people. The auditorium is used for physics lectures and conferences. It is also used for public lecture series and art events as well. You may notice that you can see through from one side of the building to the other. Most of the office spaces in the building are on either the right or left side, and there are higher floors with crossover points. The central part of the building is an open airy space called the atrium that goes from the first floor all the way up to the 16th floor. And we're going to take a brief opportunity now to get a look from inside Wilson Hall of the atrium facing out towards the direction we just drove. This footage was recorded by Ryan Postal of our Creative Services Department, and we'll see more of his work throughout this tour. You may also notice an interesting shape in the grassy area right outside the window. This is our Fermilab logo. It was designed by Dr. Wilson and artist Angela Gonzalez, our 11th employee. It is based on two of the electromagnets we use to control our particle beams throughout the lab. The parallel lines represent a dipole magnet, and the four curved lines represent a quadrupole magnet. The dipole magnets steer the beams, and the quadrupole magnets focus the beams in our accelerators. To our right, you can see one of our newest buildings still under construction. This is the Integrated Engineering Research Center, or IERC for short. This building connects directly to Wilson Hall, and it will provide a space under one roof for engineering specialists to work more closely with each other and with the personnel who work in Wilson Hall. And the flagpoles we are seeing fly the flags of the countries who participated in experiments based at Fermilab. There are currently over 40 countries whose flags are rotated throughout the year on the 20 poles outside and 16 more inside the atrium. So as we swing around to the west side of Wilson Hall, you're gonna see a squarish building to our left. It houses the first stage of our accelerator chain. The particles for our beam are created using hydrogen gas and an ion source. They are then extracted through a hole the size of a cello string into our 11 and a half foot, three and a half meter long radio frequency quadrupole or RFQ. The particles begin accelerating here and reach an energy of 750,000 electron volts and a speed of 4 about 4% of the speed of light before they enter the second stage of acceleration in our linear accelerator or LINAC. The LINAC is roughly 500 feet or about 150 meters long and extends from that squarish building beneath the rounded earth mound or berm that we're seeing. When particles reach the end of the LINAC, they are traveling at about 70% of the speed of light 
and have reached 400 million electron volts in energy. An electron volt is a unit that physicists use to describe the energy of a particle. At the end of the LINEC, the particles are transferred into the 1,500-foot the 1, or 457 meter circular booster accelerator. The steam coming from the center of the booster ring there comes from the, DI, from the water treatment plant that provides deionized cooling water for magnets in the accelerators. In the booster ring, particles circle the accelerator 20,000 times a second. They are accelerated to 8 billion electron volts. And as the particles leave the booster ring, they are traveling over 98% of the speed of light. And to give you a better perspective, let's get a look from overhead of this area. And you can see the earth mound or berm coming right up to the roof of the linear accelerator office space. The accelerator itself is below the grassy area. And at the end of the LINEC, we can see the booster ring and that black building is that water treatment plant that I was talking about. And across from there is our muon comp complex. This first building we are seeing will house an experiment called mu to e The experiment is currently under construction. And the goal of the experiment is to learn whether muons can spontaneously convert into electrons. That's why it's called mu to e the building next to it houses the muon G minus two experiment. The experiment's muon storage ring is a 50 foot, 15 and a quarter meter diameter precision superconducting magnet. And physicists here use the magnet to measure the spin property of muons, which they believe could reveal new physics. You can see how far we've come on the map so far. We still have quite a ways to go, so let's continue on. And we'll continue driving towards the biggest accelerator ring on the site, which is a four mile, 6.4 kilometer in circumference ring. This is where both the main ring and the Tevatron that I've been talking about were located. The main ring was orig the original highest energy accelerator on site. It was superseded by the Tevatron, the world's first superconducting accelerator in the early 80s. They're both located approximately 30 feet or about nine meters below the berm. And you may notice some pipes running above the berm covering the accelerator tunnel as we pass over it. These pipes contain both helium and nitrogen in liquid and gas form, which was used to cool the magnets in the Tevatron. And inside the main ring here is also the first prairie restoration site of the lab that Dr. Robert Betts of Northeastern Illinois University helped to establish and maintain. So the new construction that we are seeing to our left is for our new big accelerator project known as PIP2 or the Proton Improvement Plant. PIP2 will replace that existing LINEC we passed and be the foremost facility in the world for particle physics research using intense beams. Protons from a hydrogen source will be formed into a beam and accelerated by superconducting radio frequency cavities built here at Fermilab. Particles will go from 7% of the speed of light to 84% of the speed of light when they exit into the booster ring. When the new accelerator turns on in 2028, hopefully, beam power will be 1.2 megawatts. A later upgrade will bring it to 2.4 megawatts. PIP2 is being built with significant international participation, making it a first of its kind collaboration on accelerator technology for the Department of Energy. This new accelerator will enable the production of an extremely intense neutrino beam, an essential component of our flagship deep underground neutrino experiment, also known as DUNE. And you'll hear more about this when we pass by the DUNE on-site experiment site. Here's an aerial view of the PIP2 construction site. The building that's currently there is a cryo plant for the accelerator. The accelerator building itself has not been started yet. And this is a rendering of what the site will look like when construction is completed in that area. So as we continue to our left, you can see the east side of Wilson Hall and the back of the new integrated engineering research building. So the small white block-like building we are about to pass is an access point to the accelerator tunnel. 
And we'll see more of them as we drive around the ring, including the one that's straight ahead, the smaller one. The curved white building in the distance behind it is our Feynman Computing Center. It was named for Richard Feynman, a Nobel laureate and theoretical physicist. He also did important early work in computing and is one of the originators of the idea of quantum computing. He never actually worked here, but he did visit the lab in 1972. The design of the building was influenced by Robert Wilson, and I'll describe more about the building later and what it does and what we do there. And the big orange tanks we are approaching were once filled with helium gas, which was later liquefied on site and then used to cool the super superconducting magnets in the Tevatron. And we're now approaching the Illinois Accelerator Research Center, or IARC. IARC, sorry. At this facility, scientists and engineers work side by side with industrial partners to research and develop breakthroughs in accelerator science and technology and translate them into publicly available products and services. Building and testing new accelerator technology is done in this part of IARC that we are seeing, and in addition to attracting new private industry partners that will create new high-tech jobs, IARC also collaborates with local universities and serves as a training facility for a new generation of scientists, engineers, and technical staff in accelerator technology. We're going to get an aerial view of IARC heading south now. And the lab was awarded Leadership Energy Environmental Design Gold Certification for features such as a geothermic heating and cooling system and a green roof. Behind the IARC building, we see the first ever large scale prairie restoration led by Dr. Betts that I was talking about. So when Fermilab was built, the first accelerator in the tunnel was called the main ring and it was the most powerful accelerator in the world. Its designed energy was 200 billion electron volts, but it eventually accelerated particles to 500 billion electron volts. By 1985, the Tevatron had replaced the main ring as the most powerful accelerator on site. The Tevatron was named after its designed energy of 1 trillion electron volts. It directed the beam using superconducting magnets, protons circled the ring clockwise, which is the direction we are traveling, and antiprotons circled the ring counterclockwise. The two, the two beams collided in the centers of two detectors, CDF and D0. The CDF experiment was located where the IARC building now stands, and we're currently heading towards the D0 experiment. The crowning achievement for both was the 1995 discovery of the tar quark, one of the fundamental particles of nature. And we've driven about around halfway around the ring to the site of the D0 assembly building, which will be on the other side of this blue building behind the white building that appears in the distance. Inside that blue building, a four-story detector captured data from the collisions of those proton and anti-proton beams that I talked about. And about 10 petabytes of data were collected over a span of 26 years by this experiment and are housed in the Feynman Computing Center. So let's take a moment to get out and stretch our legs a little bit, because we've been driving for a while, and look around for a bit. We have driven two miles, or 3.2 kilometers, around the ring, and we can see Wilson Hall directly across from us. Fermilab's prairie restoration under the direction of Dr. Betts began in 1973, and fire plays an important role in restoration. The smoke you are seeing is from a prescribed burn. Burning is necessary to maintain the health of a prairie, and we'll get back in the car and I'll describe a little bit more about that. So burning distributes nutrients back into the soil, removes dead brush and kills invasive species. Fermilab's ecologist, our roads and grounds crew and our on-site fire department supervise all the prescribed burns on site. The crew is creating a fire break around the area to be burned right now. And we'll keep an eye on how the burn progresses as we go through the rest of the site. This red barn here we are passing is one of many original barns on site, and it's currently being used for storage. And there's our burn again off in the distance. So now we're gonna work our way back to the south side of Wilson Hall, where we entered the ring. During breaks or lunchtime, employees can be seen using the ring for exercise. Once a year, employees celebrate Health and Fitness Day by walking, biking, rollerblading, or running around the ring. 
And we've now completed circling the ring and we will be exiting the ring and driving past the booster ring and behind the muon experiments towards our neutrino experiment area. Get one final look at that burn there. Pass by the muon experiments. So first, we're going to pass by the old antiproton source, where antiprotons were created from proton collisions with a target. The collection and storage rings are underground and have been repurposed to provide our two muon experiments with an intense muon beam. And there's more of the antiproton source. So we're approaching MI8, a building in the main injector area. The main injector was commissioned in 1999 and is the largest, most powerful accelerator currently running on site. It is elliptical in shape and approximately two miles or 3.2 kilometers around. It was formerly an injector accelerator for the Tevatron and now its beam is used to create multiple neutrino beams for experiments both on and off site, including these off to our right, which are our short baseline neutrino experiments. But before I talk about them, I'm going to talk a little bit more about Dune, our flagship experiment. So the property we are approaching to our right will be the site of a detector for this international experiment. Our new PIC2 accelerator will help create an intense neutrino beam, and this beam will pass through an underground detector on site uh, located in the spot. Then the beam will travel 800 miles or about 1,287 kilometers directly through the Earth to the enormous Dune detector in Leeds, South Dakota. It will hold roughly 70,000 tons or 63,500 metric tons of ultra pure liquid argon and be located about one mile or 1.6 kilometers underground in an abandoned gold mine. And physicists will use this data from this experiment to shed light on some of the mysteries of the universe, such as what is the relationship between matter and forces, how do galaxies form, and how does matter even exist? So we're gonna head back to those buildings that we just passed. And we can see that our prairie burn is still going strong. The crew is still working on that fire break, fire break I just mentioned earlier, and it will take a while for that break to be created. Fermilab is hosting three short baseline neutrino experiments, which will use a shorter beam line of neutrinos than the Dune experiment. This beam is called the booster neutrino beam, and it will pass sequentially through three liquid argon detectors. These underground detectors are needed to study neutrino oscillations over a short time and distance from the target where the neutrino beam is produced. And this first building that we're seeing here is the target hall where that beam is being produced, that booster neutrino beam. The three experiments are then spread out over approximately a third of a mile or a half a kilometer. So we'll drive past this first target hall here. So the building up ahead to our left is the short baseline neutrino near detector building, and that's where that detector will be housed. And this is also the first of those three experiments that I was talking about to study neutrinos. And we're gonna drive on now and visit where the other two detectors along that same beam line will be. So this next building on our right is called the liquid argon test facility. The second detector in the beam line is located here, and the experiment here is called microboom. The third detector in the beam line is behind the hill there in the silver gray building, and it's called Icarus. In addition to studying neutrino oscill oscillations, the three detectors will also be searching to see if a particle called the sterile neutrino exists. The second building to the left of the gray one is called the Minos building. It is the on-site access point for the NOVA experiment, which uses a neutrino beam sent from Fermilab, sent from Fermilab 500 miles or 805 kilometers north to Minnesota, and it provides access to several underground experiments. And we're gonna do a little flyover of this area so you can get a look at the neutrino campus from above. 
And in between the two roads and beyond is more restored prairie and woodland. So we've driven quite a bit, but we still have a ways to go. So we're gonna continue our tour heading east now from Wilson Hall towards the IARC building, but now on the outside of the ring. And wow, look at that burn, it is really in full swing, but that break still has not been completed yet. That fire break is still going on. We'll get a better view of that. So to our left here is the Feynman Computing Center that I talked about earlier. The FCC houses part of the vast amount of experimental data from CDF and D0 and other experiments that have been done on site and off because we do store stuff from labs outside of Fermilab. The data is stored on magnetic tapes, which are accessed robotically. We have stored over 100 petabytes worth of data already and have the capacity to store over 600 petabytes. And this blue and orange building is part of our industrial complex and industrial building complex that I'll talk about in a minute. So we're now approaching the IARC building from outside of the ring. And wow, they have a nice view there, don't they? So I did mention that the IARC has a green roof earlier. So we're going to see in a minute once we pass by the speed limit sign there, we'll be able to see an image showing a portion of the green roof that I was talking about earlier. This is what the roof of that blue building there looks like. And the orange building on the right was part of our CDF experiment area that I had talked about earlier as well. Now across the street from IARC is our industrial building complex. And here we build and test equipment such as magnets and radio frequency cavities that are used in accelerator areas both on and off site. It is also one of several sites for Fermilab's quantum research that, that we are doing now. And ahead is another one of uh, Robert Wilson's sculptures called Tractricious. It's made from leftover stainless steel cryostat tubes from the Tevatron construction. And many of his sculptures are actually made from recycled material. And we'll get a nice overview of Tractricious and the IARC and the industrial building complex. And we can see Feynman Computing Center off in the distance there. On our left, left is the bison pasture, and I know it's very popular, and another original barn. Dr. Wilson brought bison to the lab as a symbol of the history of the Midwest and the lab's research being at the frontier of particle physics. They are genetically pure and descend from bison that were here before settlers even arrived. And we'll see more of them later. So you can see now some of the large open land areas that we have on site. Some of the land is actually leased by local farmers and some of it is used for environmental studies. The area to our left is currently leased land and on the right, there's actually carbon sequestration studies being performed. We're now at what's called the Fermilab village, village, which is on the east side of the site. So before the lab was built, the site was owned by farmers and contained the town of Weston, Illinois. The white buildings that were passing belonged to some of the original farmers, as well as that barn there, and were relocated to this spot when the lab was built. They are now used as temporary residences for short term visitors. So to our right is where the town of Weston was located. We'll see that in just a second. Behind you'll see some orange and blue buildings. Those were also part of the town of Weston. And here's an aerial view of the village. So this area is now used uh, as dormitories and has a machine shop and laboratories and a seed garden and a gym and a pub. And now let's continue our tour. So you can notice that that fire is still burning from our prairie burn. This video took over an hour to film and notice that the fire break still hasn't been completed yet. They're still working on it. 
And the path off to our right here runs from the east entrance all the way to the west entrance. And walkers and bicyclists from on and off site normally use this year round. So since 1969, the lab has been home to a herd of bison. The lab auctions the yearlings annually to keep the herd self-sustaining. Although there is a barn here, the bison don't use it because they prefer the outdoors. Since we are passing the bison pasture, let's stop and see what they're up to. I think it looks like they're eating in there. So let's get a little bit of a better view of the herd courtesy of some of Ryan's footage. So we've now covered about 70%, 75% of our tour, and we'll go on to the last leg of our journey. We'll leave the bison and head towards where some of the lab's earliest experiments were performed in an area called the fixed target area. It was called this because particle beams collided with stationary target at the end of a beam line. A switch yard sent beams down three separate beam pipes to experiment in those areas. We will visit all three of the locations. The building we can see up in the distance there to our right, which we're going to pass by in a second, is called the Proton Pagoda. So the Proton, Proton Pagoda once housed the control room for the Proton Area experiments. The Proton Area is the easternmost area of that fixed target area. The bottom quark was discovered in the Proton Area in 1977, and you may notice that the staircase in the building is the shape of a double helix. So we're now going to drive down between two beam lines in the fixed target area. You can start to see the berm to the left through the fence. It'll become more clear once we get past the fence. Uh, and there is another one to the right, which we cannot see. The berm on the left leads to the westernmost target area, which was called the Mason Lab. The one to the right leads to the central target area, which was our neutrino, be neutrino area. A beam of particles traveled through pipes embedded below the berms to both of these areas. The building with the curved roof to the left housed experiments and was repurposed into the Fermilab test beam facility. Researchers from around the world come here to test detector components there. And you can see there's smoke going on behind the test beam facility. This is another prairie burn, but it's not actually being conducted on site. It's actually being conducted further north of the Fermilab property. And you may have also noticed our distinctive power poles. So these were designed by Dr. Dr. Wilson. Uh, they are known as the pi poles around the lab because they resemble the shape of the Greek letter pi. They were originally made of wood and after 40 years were replaced with these steel versions. And we're now gonna head to the central area formerly called the neutrino area, but referred to now as the SIDET, short for the S silicon detector facility. So we're actually behind SIDET right now looking at the bubble chamber. And the buildings over here surrounding the bubble chamber contain clean rooms and labs for developing silicon-based components for detectors and telescopes. Small components to large-scale assemblies built here are used in experiments around the world, including at the South Pole. The 15-foot, 4.6-meter bubble chamber, the largest bubble chamber in the world, was originally housed in the silver building behind it. It was the main detector in the neutrino beam line and was filled with liquid hydrogen. It was used to detect elementary particles and nuclear reactions. And ahead, what we're seeing is the FAST facility, which stands for Fermilab Accelerator Science and Technology Facility. And we'll get another look at that real quickly. It's the home of IOTA, a small innovative accelerator used for testing accelerator design concepts. To our left is the front of SIDET. The geodesic dome roof at the end covers a high ceilinged assembly area where the dark energy survey camera DCAM was built. The 570 meg megapixel camera is mounted on the Blanco telescope in Chile. In each snapshot that it takes, it is able to capture light from over 100,000 galaxies up to 8 billion light years away.
And we're now gonna drive behind the Mason area towards that test beam facility that I talked about earlier. And you may notice as we pass by this test beam facility from behind that there are split culverts on the roof. This is another one of Dr. Wilson's innovative design features. You may also notice that they're orange in color. And in fact, the building is blue and we've seen a lot of blue and orange on buildings around the campus. Dr. Wilson and Angela Gonzalez chose the color scheme for the lab to bring a unique aesthetic to the site. The last site we're gonna see is the home of the Fermilab Fire Department. So we actually employ 18 firefighters who work in three shifts and much of their work is fortunately preventative. However, we're glad to have them on site. Today, they're out monitoring the prairie burn that we've been seeing throughout the tour. And just like now, we're seeing it up ahead. We've now finished driving around the whole complex and we're gonna be heading, ending by heading back to Wilson Hall. If you haven't already, please type your questions in the chat and our experts and myself will be answering them shortly. I hope you enjoyed the tour and we're gonna take one last look at Fermilab from above with some of more of Ryan's aerial footage. Laura, thank you for that amazing tour. Oh, you're um, welcome. It, that was, it, it, it was, um, it, we would rather be on site, but um, that, that certainly filled the bill. Um, so it's time for some questions. A, a question about geology. Uh, given so much of the experimental activity that happens underground, do the characteristics of the soil have any effect on the result? And is the geology of the parcel at Fermilab and in the Midwest of any benefit to the physics research? Anybody, I can talk a little bit about that if in, in I, somebody else. I guess I'm gonna answer this one as well. Um, so the reason Fermilab and specifically Batavia was chosen was a number of things. We're close to some major airports. We have, uh, easy access to those airports. Um, the land is relatively flat, which made it really convenient for um, building the accelerators. We don't have issues with um, tornado, well, we have tornadoes, but our accelerators are underground, so we don't have to worry about that so much. Uh, we don't have to deal with hurricanes so much, so that's another nice feature. Uh, and I would say that's about all I know. <laughs> Do you know anything else, Valerie? Um, there was also some factor in that it was sort of centrally located um, in, in the country. And there's also, this isn't so much specific to this particular site, but also that it isn't associated with um, a facility or an institution that already existed. Um, that was also a consideration when they were deciding where it would be. And there were some different thoughts on what the best way um, to go about that was. But um, so, yeah, it was uh, this sort of centrally located site and it wasn't affiliated with another location in addition to, to all the things that you mentioned. Yeah, of course, the accelerator itself has to be uh, absolutely flat, so you need to, it was good to have a flat -ish surface. Um, and uh, unlike CERN, where the Large Hadron Collider, as you know, it's a bigger machine, but that was done by tunnel boring because there you're going through rock under mountains and so on. So that was quite a different construction. Here, we, we didn't have to bore a tunnel. It was cut, it was cut and filled like. And, and a couple of people are wondering what a fire break is. So Maureen, do you want to get that one? 
Okay, well, I've not been experienced with fires uh, as a volunteer. We don't get involved with that, but as my understanding is that they usually mow the area around the uh, perimeter of a where they're going to burn just to slow the fire down so they can easily put it out should, as it goes to areas where they don't want it to be. Yeah, it's a preventative thing to prevent Correct. it from jumping across to other areas that they Correct. don't want burned. Right. The burn itself is controlled and it's to strengthen the prairie, right? So it burns away weak plants like weeds and so on, and the stronger plants with seeds underground survive. So it's a restoring the prairie. It helps to have burns, which happen naturally in the wild because of lightning and so on. That's correct. That's why we do it. That's that's for years. That's how our prairies developed it was with fire. Mm. And why was Batavia chosen as a site and how does Fermilab give back to the city? Valerie, you want to grab that one? I think, well, I think the, um, the reason that the space near Batavia was chosen was um, some of the, you know, the reasons we talked about before in terms of its, um, you know, location near, you know, major universities, um, centrally located, some of the geologic features. Um, and in, in terms of how it gives back to the community, um, there's, there's been a lot of um, you know, interaction between the lab and the local communities. There's all the education programs that the lab offers. There's all the jobs that are created by the lab. Um, there's, so there's all kinds of connections like that. I could comment also, when Fermilab was first uh, conceived, it was after the Second World War and physicists were sort of riding high in reputation and it was decided by the government that there should be a world-leading accelerator for particle physics. And, um, it, sorry, my phone's ringing, I've got the camera. Uh, so at the, the time, the centers of particle physics were on the East Coast and the West Coast. The East Coast was in Brookhaven, and the West Coast, California, Stanford, and so on. And Bob Wilson came and said, look, this doesn't make sense. We should have it centrally. We've got the Midwest here. It's a perfect site geographically, and so on. And that and he said also, and we can build it cheaper. So um, that's he won. He won that. He won out, unfortunately. And um, as far as finance is concerned, you can see that roughly um, per per taxpayer or per inhabitant of the U.S., we're talking about a budget like a dollar per year, per person per year. But if you live, of course, within the catchment area of Fermi Lab, a lot of that goes in salaries, paid back in shop, and so on. So you, if you live within 20, 30 miles of Fermi Lab, you're you're getting a lot more back than you, than you pay in taxes, which is like a dollar a year, something like that. And how many people are employed and what type of degree do you need for employment? That sort of depends on the job. I mean, we have roughly over 1800 employees probably right about now. Um, and they range from having PhDs to their high school graduates. So the, the rate, it depends on the job you're doing and what skills you need. We have uh, people who work in our machine so shops who we couldn't do without. Um, that's not a formal university education, but that is many, many years of training in order to be able to do some of the stuff in our machine shop area. So it, it really depends on the job position. And not all of our physicists are even PhDs. Uh, they are, some of them are just uh, masters, they're engineering physicists, so they don't go on for the PhD, they just have a master's degree. Laura, do you know how many uh, research physicists there are on, on staff, actually? Roughly around, I think 300 was the last number I knew about. Uh, I don't know if that, how much that has changed. It goes up and down as um, uh, we yeah, shift around that, doing things. It should be pointed out that most of the users of that experiments are not Fermi Lab scientists. They're from all around the world, actually, all around the country, certainly, in collaboration. And also we have a lot of scientists from Europe and Japan and so on working on Fermilab experiments. So it's a very global, or at least multinational endeavor. And what is the next expected big discovery from Fermilab? <laughs> <laughs> Good question. Good right. question. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, of course, we're searching. We, the thing, we know that we're not, we don't know all the particles that exist. We're pretty sure about that because we know particles that make up atoms and so on. And we have the so-called standard model of particles, which I could go on about for a long time. But it seems that there, there's, there's more matter that we don't understand what it is. It doesn't fit in our present plan. 
our present understanding. And it's astronomers who discovered this by looking at galaxies and measuring the rotation curve of galaxies. Initially, that was a women astronomer called Vera Rubin, who showed that the galaxy, the Andromeda galaxy and others too, there's more matter in there pulling the stars together than we can account for in the stars and planets and gas and dusk. It's called dark matter. Um, it's actually well, invisible matter. And we suppose it's made of particles that we haven't yet discovered. So we're desperately searching for such particles. Either they could be very massive, we're trying to find them at the Large Hadron Collider, we didn't find them at the Tevatron, or perhaps they're actually very light particles um, that are just weakly interacting, so they're very hard to produce. And so now the race is on to find such particles. Um, and um, there are theorists develop many, many theories about them. Um, and so experimenters, there are many experiments, I'm one of them, looking for uh, these particles that might, we hope would, if they exist, we can find them, we hope. So, so that's, one, that, that's one thing. Um, whether the next big discovery will be a dark matter discovery or, um, or some, something else, of course, we don't know. We're looking in, in many, many ways for this. But um, it was mentioned this experiment measuring the muon magnetic moment in this ring called G minus two ring. And theorists could calculate, thanks to Feynman, really, it took about 12 decimal places the magnetic strength of the electron and of the muon also down to eight so decimal places. And experimental theory disagree in the last decimal places. And that's very intriguing because it means if the experiment is absolutely right, that there's something missing in the theory. And it could be these dark matter particles or particles that connect dark matter particles to the particles we know. So, so we're excited about those things. We know there's things missing from our standard model, um, but we don't know what they are yet. But theorists have lots of ideas and we're searching. And how many of bison are on site? Valerie, do you know the current count? The last I knew it was like around 32. I know we had like 18 babies last uh, spring. Yeah, I am not sure uh, how many bison we have at the moment. It's it's varied, you know, at different times. Um, and so it I depends on also if they sold them off too, right? Yeah, so I'm so I'm not sure what the exact count is right now, but some something in that ballpark, you know, more, you know, more than ten, less than a hundred. <laughs> it's, it's yeah. usually between it's usually between twenty five and thirty. Um, there's limited space because they're in a little they're in a fenced area, so they do have to auction them off as needed to keep that that number between them twenty five and thirty. Yeah, they, they, they get born. I saw one being born once. It was very cool to see, just watch it. And it, well, <laughs> it dropped out of its mummy. Um, of course, it, now, now it's a season coming. And then, yeah, and then um, they're up and walking yeah. 15 minutes later. So that's really cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And a lot of them are sent to start new herds or strengthen herds elsewhere. And some are sent for butchering. Yes, we don't do that on site, I think. But, um, but yeah. So. No. And Maureen, I, I, this is probably for you. How does the lab handle the massive job of natural areas restoration? Um, well, it's Fermilab has an ecologist and he is assisted by the Fermilab Rose and Grounds. And then I'm part of Fermilab Natural Areas, which is an all volunteer group, which assists them. And we do everything from removing of invasive species. We collect seeds from um, native plants. Uh, we plant native plants and put them in areas where we think they need some more biodiversity. And um, we work year round when we're allowed on site, but right now <laughs> we are not allowed on site. And uh, the, the experiment you mentioned between Batavia and South Dakota, has a tunnel been dug all the way between both sites? <laughs> no. I can answer that. Neutrinos <laughs> don't need to go through tunnels. Neutrinos go right through the earth. With, you know, you can, send, you can send a billion of them pointing through the earth and uh, they'll nearly all come out the other side because they interact so very, very weakly. So we point a beam of neutrinos at the, at the laboratory there, but they go through the earth. You don't need to make a tunnel for them. In fact, they're the only particles we know that do go through so much material. Neutrinos are made in the center of the sun by nuclear reactions and they come out of the sun and they come to us. And they've been detected deep underground in a mine and 
they could see the directions the neutrinos were coming from and they could see the sun at night through the earth with their neutrino telescope. Isn't that cool? And we've only got time for a couple more questions. Um, if, if all three of you would want to field this, uh, what's the favorite part of your work? If I'm I'll you go know. first. <laughs> Okay, Laura, okay. I, I love I love interacting with people when we're giving tours and I love like being in the cafeteria at lunchtime and just being able to hear all of the different language and the diversity of people that are here at the lab. It's always great. I'll be sitting there and I can be hearing one language one minute and two seconds later I'll hear a different language and it it's it's just awesome to have that and to be able to first of all talk to the public about it, but then just to be able to see it on a daily basis yeah it's it's such a cool place you know and I, I love the architecture and so i used to come every morning and say wow this is so cool now i haven't been in i've hardly been in two years right and i'm really missing the interaction with other physicists day to day where you can go in look at a white blackboard or white book and say what about this idea you know and sure because we can interact with email and zoom but it's not the same thing so i'm i'm now allowed to go in one day a week if i have a special reason to and i'm triply vaxxed and so on and so forth but I'm looking forward to getting back and having one-on-one -on -one interactions. And the science is so compelling, you know, it's so exciting. I mean, I retired five years ago, but I'm still doing it because it's, it's my passion, right? I'm lucky. <laughs> yeah, and what, what I, my favorite part is almost exactly the same thing that Laura and Mike have just said. It's, it's interacting with the people. Um, it's, it's such a great place to work. And, and one of the things that I love about being the lab's archivist and historian is getting to meet people oftentimes when they're retiring, when they've spent a large chunk or sometimes all of their careers at the lab um, and getting to interview them and learn about um, all that they've done during their careers. So that's, that's my favorite part of my job. Maureen, do you want to comment? You're a volunteer. Sure. Um, I love, I love the work of restoration. I've learned a lot from the people that work at Fermilab about restoration and about uh, the environment in the Midwest. And um, I love the people I work with and the volunteers. Great. I would say the other thing that I love is the, being a photographer. I love going to take pictures. So my background is actually a picture from just a couple of weeks ago of what the lab looked like a couple of weeks ago. Could I add one, one comment, Rick, about international nature of the science here we do? Because because it's pure science, it's not it's not political, it's not it's not anything to do with religion and so on. And people come from all over the world, we work together. It's even more so at CERN, where practically all the countries in the world are working together. And I think this is a real important force for peace in the world because you understand how you know people can work together in peace and harmony, generally speaking. Um, and, and personally, I think that um, CERN and Fermilab should get the Nobel Peace Prize for this, uh, actually. We, you can't give a, a physics prize, Nobel Prize for discovering the top quark because it can be given to three people only and there were far too many people involved to pick out three. Again, with the Higgs boson, we gave it to Peter Higgs and, and theorists, but the experimenters have found it there's too many people involved to give it to one, two or three people. But the Peace Prize can be given to an organization. And if you read, if you read what the Peace Prize is about, we fit perfectly. So I, I'm proposing that CERN and Fermilab should share the Nobel Peace Prize. There you go. <laughs> yes. Um, both I like that music. thought, Mike. Yeah, yes. Well, we are out of time. Uh, if you would like more information about anything you've heard, check out the Fermilab website at fnal.gov. It's loaded with information about our scientific research, our arts and lecture series, and all our educational opportunities. While we're not currently open to the public, we have many virtual events and resources that can be accessed through our website. We also have a presence on many social media platforms such as Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. Go check them out. Thanks to our site experts, Mike Abro. Valerie Higgins and Maureen Huey. Also thanks to our tour guide, Laura Paterno, and our behind the scenes tech crew, Maureen Hicks and Amanda Early. And thanks to you all for joining our tour. We hope to see you at some of our other events. Have a good evening.